Good morning, I'm Rosalie, and today we'll share resources that can help save lives through new medical treatments and how you can take on a positive attitude and fight your pain. More when we return. Anyone at any age can contract meningococcal meningitis, but teens and young adults are among those at the highest risk of this infection due to teens' common lifestyles and behaviors of socializing in crowded conditions. The Center for Disease Control recommends preteens 11 to 12 years old should be vaccinated with meningococcal vaccine. And older teens at 16 years old need a second shot to stay protected against a higher risk factor. Joining us is pediatric immunization expert, Dr. Todd Wallen and meningitis survivor, Francesca Testa, to share the importance of the 16 vaccine campaign. Good morning to both of you. Good morning. Good morning. So doctor, how needed is this critical vaccine that young students don't realize how quick and deadly meningococcal meningitis can be? Can you share some statistics? Sure, the, the meningitis bacteria can hit up to, uh, we can see 600 to 1,000 cases per year in the US. The, the critical piece is how rapid and how deadly this bacteria can be. So you can go from mild symptoms to fighting for your life uh, within as little as 24 hours, Rosalie. Tell us of the importance of the 16 vaccine campaign. Yeah, so the, the critical part about this is that the first dose, as you pointed out, um, for the CDC recommended vaccine to get it at age 11 to 12 is, is frequently um, received oftentimes because it's a part of school entry. So parents know about it, kids know they need their form signed, doctors are used to giving it. But even though this is also a CDC recommended, safe and effective recommended vaccine for age 16, there's not that hallmark moment to get it and oftentimes it falls through the cracks. And then you're left with a person who is unvaccinated for that second dose, not giving them the protection, as you pointed out, to when there's really critical risks, like living in close quarters, say in college dormitories, as they get into their later teens and early 20s and because of the types of behaviors of sharing fluids, drinking, kissing, um, this bacteria can be spread. And if they don't have that 16, uh, the 16 year old dose, they're left um, susceptible and we want to protect every kid that we can. Some parents are unaware of how deadly this disease can be. Right, so the, the scary thing again with this rapid nature is it may start with vague symptoms and it may be misdiagnosed and Francesca will share her story. But um, absolutely, you can have a fatality rate even once it's appropriately diagnosed and appropriate antibiotics are started of 10 to 15% fatality rate even if appropriate um, measures are taken. And if the bacteria gets into your bloodstream, you're looking at a fatality rate as high as 40%. All right, Francesca, you were diagnosed with the flu. Tell us about this misdiagnosis. Yes, yeah, so uh, what initially started off as, as typical flu symptoms about 24 hours later progressed rapidly to where I was in a coma for about two weeks. Um, I woke up one morning with typical flu symptoms. I had a high fever, uh, headaches, stiff neck, severe body aches, and I did go to my local pediatrician where they did initially diagnose me as the flu. Um, and so within 12 hours, there was such a rapid progression of my symptoms um, that by the time I did get to the intensive care unit that evening, uh, my parents had about a, were given about a 20% chance that I may survive the night um, and that my right leg may have to be amputated at that point. Um, and even though I did survive and you know, I'm here, you know, speaking with, with you today. Um, you know, I do still live with long-term complications from having bacterial meningitis. Um, I do still have hearing and vision loss and some cognitive delays and impairment, um, as well as severe headaches. Um, and I was only about two months shy of, of having gotten that vaccine. So at the time I contracted bacterial meningitis, I was not vaccinated. And that's why it's so you, important. Mm -hmm. So important for really? doctors, yeah, uh, for doctors to you know recognize the symptoms, but for parents to be you know their their teens advocate as well and speak to their doctor and to make sure that they do get that second dose at at age 16. How old were you when you contracted this disease? Um, I was 17. I was just finishing up my senior year in high school um, and, and really looking forward to college and graduation and prom and and, and really all that changed uh, in as little as 24 hours. Francisca, how did this affect your group of friends and family 
after contracting this disease. So, I mean, everyone, you know, including my friends, my family, my siblings, um, even our community and, and, and the school system at large um, in my town, um, everyone, of course, was, was nervous and, and worried because, you know, meningitis is something that can spread and, and something that is contagious. And, and of course, my friends and, and parents having to see me, you know, in a hospital bed on a respirator in a coma and, and not sure, you know, if I would survive or if I would pull through, um, you know, that, that's devastating for both my friends and family and something that, you know, I would never want any other family to go through, any other parents, any other child. Um, and, and this is something that could have been prevented had I been vaccinated. Doctor, how rare are these symptoms that can develop as rapidly as it did for Francesca? That can claim a young life in 24 hours? Yeah, that's, that's the scariest part about this bacteria. It's not that rare for it to be able to, to progress so quickly. That's one of the hallmarks about this disease. So in, in Francesca's case, went from some fever, some body aches to severe body aches, severe headache, high fever. And then as she pointed out, within 12 hours of having been seen by a doctor or diagnosed with flu, went on to then having to be in, uh, admitted into a hospital and then into a intensive care unit on a, a ventilator and in a coma for two weeks. So that's, that's the, the key point about this bacteria. It can go from you know, zero to 60 like this. And so the beautiful thing is we have a safe, effective vaccine that can prevent this. And so the, again, with the first dose at 11 to 12, but that second dose at age 16, which is why we're thrilled to be part of the National Meningitis Association's campaign here, uh, with more information on their website as well, the16vaccine.org, to, to inform families, kids, and, and doctors if they need a, uh, some additional information on it. Francesca, your experience created a unique advocacy opportunity as a survivor to raise awareness of preventing meningococcal disease. How do you initiate the conversation with teens to visit their doctor at 16 and receive that second dosage? You know, since uh, I've had bacterial meningitis, um, I've been working with the local communities, states, and even nationally to really try to share my story and, and to, to share the message that this is something that is present, uh, potentially preventable with a vaccine. Um, I've been working with the National Meningitis Association for quite a few years. Um, I do uh, currently also have my master's in public health, um, which I was inspired to get, you know, since surviving bacterial meningitis and, and having that story and being able to connect with teenagers who are the same age as, as when I contracted it. I think that message is really powerful and, and just trying to make sure that, that everyone knows that the vaccine is out there and that it is something you know, that they should get at age 16 um, as part of the second dose. And there's also other immunizations at this, in this age range as well that parents need to talk to their teen's doctor about, including the meningitis B vaccine. Doctor, what are the best resources to learn more? Yes, it's the 16, so the 16 vaccine.org. So the 16 vaccine.org and the National Meningitis Association has wonderful resources to educate families and, uh, and, and kids and even professionals if they want that information. It's, it's a really great site. Thank you, Dr. Wolin and Francesca for increasing awareness of this contagious disease. Thank you. Thanks. opens doors for students and job seekers with disabilities. Open the door to an all-inclusive workplace. Watch the upcoming episodes of Disability Mentoring and get involved in your community. Be a mentor. Did you know one in 10 babies are born too early in the U.S. That's nearly 60,000 premature babies born with a very low birth weight. In addition, one out of five have a life-threatening opening in the heart. These newborn babies face a number of health risk factors. Anthony Daly and his wife learned baby Tony was born premature with a heart defect and needed urgent treatment as they watch their baby fight for his life in a neonatal intensive care unit. The Dailies then met with Dr. Evan Zahn, who implanted the world's first device, smaller than a pea, 
and baby Tony's heart. Good morning, Anthony and Dr. Zahn. Good morning. morning. Doctor, tell us, what is this life-threatening heart defect, PDA? And how many babies are affected each year? Uh, a PDA is, is really a large vessel um, sitting just outside of the heart. You can see in this heart model here, this little white vessel that in premature babies can actually be quite large. In fact, can be the largest vessel in their body. And, and all babies are born with a PDA, but we have ways, our body has ways to genetically sort of engineer closure of that. It turns out that the more premature you're born, the earlier you come out, the less likely that those mechanisms are intact and the more likely that this vessel, this PDA, will stay open. The problem is that it connects the two circulations, which should be separate, and the effect is that the lungs get flooded with too much blood. And these are babies that are, that are very frail, very small, already have immature lungs, and if you imagine adding extra blood or extra water to those lungs, most of them end up on respirators um, in rather dire straits. Unfortunately, this is fairly common, and the more premature you are, the more common it is. So we estimate in the United States about 12,000 babies a year, somewhere between 10 and 14,000 um, will experience uh, problems with a PDA each year in the U.S., a significant number. Are there specific symptoms a baby would have with PDA? There are a number of effects that this big vessel um, can have on these tiny babies. The most typical one is, is what I mentioned, which is sort of flooding of the lungs and breathing problems. But in many cases, little Tony's included, um, the PDA is stealing blood from organs that really need it, like the brain and the bowel, and putting those organs at risk for significant and permanent damage. How long after baby Tony was born did you find out he had PDA? It, it was relatively quickly. Uh, he was born at 26 weeks and six days, uh, and I would say with Within a couple days, they, they realized that the valve had not closed and they were, they were closely monitoring, monitoring it to see, uh, as Dr. Zahn said, uh, what other complications could and, and ultimately did arise uh, from the fact that he did have a PDA. Doctor, explain the process of this procedure and how this pea-sized device works. Um, this is a, a, a tiny, very soft device that really was designed um, with these tiny babies in mind. Um, and what we do is we make a pinhole, literally a needle-sized hole in the uh, vein in the leg. And watching on TV, we advance this device up through the chambers of the heart into the PDA itself. And simply by pushing it outside of the delivery catheter, which is just a hollow piece of spaghetti, the device expands and acts like a plug to plug the PDA. One of the beauties of the Abbott Piccolo device, in addition to its tiny size and its softness, is that it's what we call retractable, meaning once you put it in, if it's not absolutely perfect, uh, you can withdraw it, you can reposition it, or you can change it out for a different size. So it really uh, adds a, a huge margin of safety um, for doing this in what you can imagine are very tiny, frail babies. This device was approved by the Federal Drug Administration. Does the device come in different sizes to fit different size babies? There are, uh, the device does come in several different sizes, and it's not so much the size isn't so much based on the individual baby as it is on the exact size of their PDA, which we can measure very precisely during the procedure. And then pick a size that's just right. Well, this is just amazing. Tony, how did you and your wife deal with baby Tony's treatment? And how did baby Tony do after his heart procedure. When you're, when you're in the NICU and you're at the, the, the mercy of, of the doctors informing you of everything that, that's happening, and, and quite frankly, you don't, you don't t totally understand everything uh, that's going on, uh, it, it, uh, it sounds like, as you know, it's, it's, it's heart-wrenching. It's, um, it's a helpless feeling that uh, I personally had never experienced before. Um, being that Tony was was our, our first our first child, um, and then Dr. Zahn, uh, he sounds sounds so humble in talking about uh, uh, the procedure, but really you're talking about uh, our son being three pounds and doing a heart procedure. Uh, it, it it it's just there's there's no way to describe um, the level of angst and helplessness uh, that that goes on in your head. Wow, sounds like an emotional roller coaster. It is, it is. Uh, each, each day, some days you have, you, you hear good news from the doctors and other days they bring up concerns. And, and for us that went on uh, 
uh, daily for weeks. Ah, and then uh, Dr. Zahn came in and um, implanted the Ab Abbott Piccolo device and uh, he really changed, uh, it turned a corner for our son. Uh, and from then, uh, the outlook was extremely positive and we saw it in him. We saw uh, the way his body reacted uh, to not having the PDA anymore and um, it, 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 it was life changing. Tony, this treatment impacted you and your extended family, right? Yeah, yeah, I'm the firstborn son of my mom and, and my brothers don't have any kids yet. So he's, uh, this was our miracle child um, and everything that, that it took to get to our first, our first kid. Um, and then obviously him being born at 26 weeks uh, was, was, um, was, was uh, devastating for the whole family. Um, and then uh, I feel like we were all in it together. Um, and, and you're just, you're so grateful that uh, these doctors spend so much of their life dedicated to finding procedures that can better, uh, you know, can, can give a better outlook to, um, to in, in our case, our son. Uh, it's just, it's, it's uh, you're internally grateful. Doctor, what follow-up is needed for babies treated with this device? Uh, it's actually uh, remarkable. We, we, after the procedure, we follow the babies fairly closely for the first few days uh, while they're in the neonatal intensive care unit, and then uh, we typically see them a few times before they go home. Once they're home, we have a few office visits, but by six months of age, if all is well as it has been in all of the babies, um, they're actually released from follow-up. This is a, a lifetime cure and we don't anticipate anything bad down the road. And most of the babies are turning to look just like little Tony, rambunctious little toddlers <laughs> who really don't need special follow-up, just routine pediatric care. And when babies grow up and into puberty, is there a daily life limitations? No, this is, uh, that's 100% correct. This is uh, what we call a one and done. Um, this is a curative procedure and uh, nothing should ever need to be done about it again. So where can our viewers learn more about the treatment of PDA? Yeah, there's, uh, there's lots of good information on the web at uh, abbottpicklow.com <clears throat> that people can go and uh, check out more information. Thanks to both of you for sharing treatments for premature babies with heart defects. Thank you. Mentoring opens doors for students and job seekers with disabilities. Open the door to an all-inclusive workplace. Watch the upcoming episodes of Disability Mentoring and get involved in your community. Be a mentor. Around 400,000 people in the United States suffer from multiple sclerosis, or more commonly known as MS. Patients who live each day with MS fight back debilitating symptoms that impacts their quality of life. And MS comes in several forms of the disease. Joining us this morning to help educate us about one form called active secondary progressive multiple sclerosis is Dr. Regina Berkovich and Paula, a patient who's living with both MS and secondary progressive MS for many years. Good morning, ladies. Hello, good morning. Good morning. Doctor, I realize diagnosing MS can be challenging because 14 years ago, my sister-in-law gave birth to her son and started experiencing eye pain. She went to many specialists. Finally, she went to a neural ophthalmologist that found swelling of her optic nerve, and she was diagnosed with MS. Well, your sister's situation is quite typical. It's frequently that uh, the first symptom might be optic neuritis, in fact, because it's a part of the central nervous system. Uh, so MS is a condition affecting the central nervous system. It's an inflammatory condition, autoimmune, and uh, uh, it comes in different clinical forms, uh, including relapsing remitting, 
and uh, secondary progressive and active secondary progressive MS is part of the secondary progressive diagnosis. So uh, what patients need to be watching uh, for those patients who've been diagnosed with relapsing remitting MS, uh, unfortunately, nearly 80% of them may progress into secondary progressive form of it. So patients and physicians should be watching for evidence of accumulation of disability and uh, accumulation of limitations of daily living, inability to keep a full-time job, for example, and it can be physical disability or it can be cognitive disability. So if a patient is diagnosed with MS, what new symptoms would help identify that the condition has progressed to active secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. That's the thing. There is not a single symptom or single test that would identify it. Sometimes it takes certain observational period for physician to make that decision. It's accumulation of different uh, maybe little things. Uh, when the condition doesn't go back to the previous level of functioning, when a uh, person has more and more limitations and more progression, as we say, it cannot do what was able to do just a year ago and usually that translates into inability to keep a job and it can be physical it can be cognitive it can be combination of the two so that's why it's very hard to give one single symptom and every patient obviously is different so both patient and physician need to be very much on top of uh, tracing the symptoms and uh, uh, MRIs as well. So doctor, what you're saying is if a patient is feeling advanced symptoms, they need to quickly communicate these differences with their doctor. That's correct. And for the active secondary progressive MS, we expect to see some evidence of inflammation on top of continuous progression as well. So that's why talk to your MS specialist. Uh, definitely reveal all the changes in how you feel. So Paula, tell us when you were diagnosed with MS and when did you begin to notice your progressive symptoms? I was diagnosed about 17 years ago right after the birth of my fourth child. And sounds like uh, my situation was similar to your sister-in-law's. I, I started losing my balance and having a few interesting things going on, but then when I had an eye problem, I had a vision problem, I went to an ophthalmologist and then a neuro-ophthalmologist, and that was the doctor who diagnosed me with MS. So my diagnosis was actually pretty quick, because um, I, went, I went to the correct specialist very quickly. And getting diagnosed can be very difficult, like you know, or in my situation, it was easy. Then how long after were you diagnosed with secondary progressive multiple sclerosis? That was probably about eight years into my uh, MS diagnosis. Uh, my symptoms were just slowly progressing. I wasn't remitting. I wasn't having exacerbations and remissions anymore. And um, my largest disability problem is in mobility, um, the, my ability to walk around. I use a walker, I use a wheelchair, I drive with hand controls, but it took a while for my doctor and I to decide that my condition really was secondary progressive MS. It, it's, it's a transition that happens often, but it's, it's hard to pinpoint exactly when it is happening. How did your life change? How did these challenges alter your lifestyle? mostly as a mother. Well, it's huge, because I, I was raising four children. I had four small children when I was diagnosed, and um, I, I was not able to be a part of all their activities, as other mothers are. You know, getting out onto a football field, into the football stadium, could be impossible in, in many you know, high school-type situations. Um, I relied on other people to take my children places and do things, but it also is a very positive impact on my children. They've seen me work really, really hard to, to do things and to, to be a volunteer. I've volunteered in many different uh, organizations through the years. And they also have learned to have empathy and to know what it is when people need help and to know when people are a bit different than what we consider the norm. So I think it's been very good for my children to grow up this way. 
But yes, I've missed out on many opportunities to do things with my children and with my husband. So doctor, I understand recently the U.S. Food and Drug Administration approved a new treatment to address secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. I'm here on behalf of Novartis, actually, and uh, we're quite excited, uh, uh, the neurologists and my specialists, about the approval of this medication because uh, it is approved for different clinical types of MS, including the early stages of it, relapsing, remitting, and also active secondary progressive MS. And what is important is that it is the first and the only oral medication for MS that has been studied, has shown efficacy, and got approved for active secondary progressive MS. So that uh, makes uh, us very... Uh, excited about it, and we definitely would like uh, patients living with MS know about this. And uh, uh, obviously, every patient uh, with MS is different, and we need to just uh, remind everyone that it's very important to continuously see your doctor, get those MRIs timely, get the follow-up, make sure the medication is working for you properly, and uh, never give up. So doctor, how long will it take a patient before they can find results from this treatment? That really is a very individual question and it depends on the patient and on uh, the fact for how long the disease has been. So that is something that needs to be discussed with the treating neurologist. Paula, what has really helped you day to day living with this progressive form of MS? Basically, you know, being diagnosed with MS can lead to a lot of uncertainty, but talk with your doctor and figure out what's going to work best for you. And just for me, what has worked is have a really good positive attitude. That's how my sister-in-law lives her life day to day with a positive attitude to fight her MS. It's admirable. Yes. All right, so where can our viewers learn more on this information? Uh, there is a special website uh, called mazent.com. Thank you, Dr. Berkovich and Paula, for joining us this morning to educate our viewers to new treatment options for patients with active secondary progressive multiple sclerosis. You're welcome. You're welcome. You're welcome. Staying positive and taking on a proactive approach to fighting disease confirms one's human strength and compassion for others. Advocacy helps educate the public and offers resources to attain a greater quality of life for many. Share your advocacy story with us at facebook.com forward slash Rosalie Show and follow us on Instagram at The Rosalie Show. And watch this episode and many others 24-7 at rosalieartershow.com. Thanks for joining us, and we look forward to seeing you soon.